Senate Republicans have spent literally months focused on the need for a strong bipartisan National Defense Authorization Act, as well as robust funding for our armed forces. Defending our homeland, deterring future threats, and supporting our allies and partners should not be last minute, low priorities. They're fundamental duties if we want to remain the strongest power in the world, and investing in strength today protects our country, our service members, and the American taxpayer tomorrow. Let's take, for example, Ukraine. For nearly a year now, the free people of a sovereign nation have stood firm and battled against brutal and lawless aggression. The Ukrainians' brave stand has made possible in part because the United States and a number of other countries have realized that supporting their self-defense directly serves our own interests. Europe, together, constitutes America's largest trading partner. Instability in Europe poses a direct threat to countless American producers who sell to our friends across the Atlantic. Further huge disruptions to European markets would only add to the inflationary challenges that Democrat spending has caused us already here at home. What's more, a successful Russian invasion would embolden the entire club of anti-American thug regimes to take bolder and more brazen steps toward further conflict, including direct threats to American lives. Every day, Russia spins on the back foot in Ukraine, degrades its own ability to wage further wars, and dramatically changes the cost-benefit calculus for others who might contemplate similar violence. Continuing support for Ukraine is the popular mainstream view that stretches across the ideological spectrum. On my side of the aisle, for example, the former Director of National Intelligence, John Ratcliffe, said recently that supporting Ukraine fully and completely is in the best interest of the United States. The top foreign policy expert at the Heritage Foundation, James Scarafano, has spoken out forcefully about the need for continued military assistance. So has former Secretary of State Pompeo, former Vice President Pence, and virtually every other leading national security official from the previous administration. Now, while the conflict has exposed serious weaknesses in Russia's ability to wage conventional war, it has also exposed shortcomings in the West, particularly with our defense industrial bases. Our European friends, who treated themselves to holidays from history after the Cold War, who presumed a new normal of stability and security and shifted spending disproportionately into domestic programs, have received a harsh, harsh wake-up call. They're rushing to reinvest more in their own defenses. Some politicians here in America fell victim to the same lullaby. Now, fortunately, supplying the specific kinds of American armaments that Ukraine needs does not cut our readiness in other important regions, such as the Pacific. China and its neighbors are watching the conflict in Ukraine closely, and the CCP would be delighted if Ukraine fell to Russia. But the long lead times to replenish what we're sending still provide us with a sober reminder. We know for a fact that the world's foremost military and economic superpower can and should both produce all the capabilities that we need for ourselves and serve as freedom's arsenal for our friends at the same time. We just need to organize our resources and make critical overdue investments in our defense industrial capacity. That's why the National Defense Authorization Act we'll take up soon provides multi-year procurement authority for longer-term certainty, planning, and efficiency. It authorizes significant investments in modernizing our force and capabilities. But following through on these promises also requires that we pass robust appropriations. I made that clear at last week's briefing with the Biden officials. I'll say it again. Providing for the common defense is a fundamental governing responsibility. It's not extra credit. Our Democratic colleagues will not receive a goodie bag of domestic spending in exchange for fulfilling this solemn duty. Now, on an entirely different matter, 
I'd like to begin my tribute to another of our distinguished departing colleagues by quoting his own words from a letter written back in 2009. Here's what he said. Dear Mr. and Ms. Carver, thank you for entrusting me with your son's memorial bracelet at the Asheville Veterans Day ceremony. I wish there had been more time to talk that day. I returned to Washington with the bracelet on my wrist. Your son's unrelenting courage and zeal for life are what I will think of when I look at his name on my wrist. Rest assured, I will wear this bracelet forever." End quote. A quiet gesture, unheralded and understated, but leaving hugely impactful ripples in its wake. A perfect case study of Senator Richard Burr. At first glance, it might appear to the uninitiated that our distinguished friend is a man of contrasts or contradictions. For example, this impeccably dressed Southern gentleman has been known to drive around town in a rickety old Volkswagen. Think that our dear departed colleague John McCain once called, quote, an assault on the census. Or take the fact that when most of us were happy enough to finish high school as either a successful jock or a successful student, Richard was both a standout scholarship football player and a winner of the science fair. Or consider that our unflappable, calm colleague with an easy manner, almost casual really, has been one of this chamber's most dogged legislators and most relentless champions across a whole array of critically important causes. That special bracelet bearing Army Chief Warrant Officer Mitch Carver's name isn't just a comfort to one Gold Star family. It's an outward sign of Richard Burr's entire approach to his job. Supporting service, honoring sacrifice, and making life better for folks in North Carolina and across the nation. For five years, Richard's colleagues tasked him with helming the Intelligence Committee, some of this nation's, some of this institution's most sensitive and critical responsibilities wound up right in his lap. But senators on both sides knew that Richard's thoughtfulness, fair-mindedness, and discretion tailor-made him for the role. No showy victory laps. No braggy press tours. He led with the serious collegial and patriotic tone that the issues actually demanded. This quiet confidence has been part of the Richard Burr brand from the very beginning. As a backbench house freshman, Richard spearheaded massive reforms of the Food and Drug Administration. Long before COVID-19, he had a personal passion for helping to equip BARDA and our other pandemic preparedness initiatives. Richard has authored transformational legislation that disability advocates call the most important advance for their cause in a quarter century. He reached across the aisle to help deliver justice for victims of decades old hate crimes. He drove bipartisan consensus on a measure that's helped save students and families near $100 billion in loan payments. In a situation folks in my own state know well, he stepped up to help tobacco farmers transition to succeed in a freer market. And as the ranking member of the Veterans Affairs Committee, Richard delivered much needed relief to men and women who have served our nation with the Veterans Choice Act of 2014. It's truly amazing what you can accomplish when you're willing to be patient, keep an even keel, share some credit, Oh, and occasionally even jump out a window. Let me explain. This is creative problem solving in action. In fact, during sequestration, when staffing shortages had closed some of the normal entrances and exits around the Capitol campus, our friend found himself in the Russell Building while the only open exit was all the way over in Dirksen. Rather than Lincoln, his commute, this ever pragmatic man of mystery found the lowest window around, grabbed his dry cleaning, shimmied out, and hopped right down to the sidewalk. Now the day is fast approaching when our colleague will escape from this institution for good. 
but Richard's remarkable legacy here will endure. Whether that's meant using his charm and judgment of character to disarm committee witnesses and get to the bottom of complex issues under investigation, or using his fluency and house speak to translate key happenings for us, his colleagues over here in the upper chamber. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention how Richard excels at turning up the pressure to break a stalemate. You see, if an issue is dragging out and no solution appears forthcoming, unless Richard was the point person himself, he'd frequently just threaten to leave town altogether until things got worked out. We're talking about a colleague who's famous for keeping closer tabs on the Senate's weekly wrap-up proceedings than just about anyone. In fact, as I understand it, Richard's team became so famous for tracking the timing of final votes so closely that some other officers would try calling Team Burr for the scoop before they'd even try the cloakroom. Now, with Richard's seemingly laid-back demeanor, you might assume our friend was just eager to get out to the beach or hit the links, but that would be another one of those deceptive appearances. The truth is, Richard didn't become an expert at speedy getaways because he wanted to shortchange his duties. In fact, it was just the opposite. Even as a devoted public servant, as Senator Burr knew that, in the final analysis, another set of duties was even more essential. When our colleague was first elected to the House in 1994, he and his beloved wife, Brooke, had two young sons. And Brooke was carving out her own tremendously successful career in business. So our friend was bound and determined that serving the people of North Carolina would not mean skimping on his proudest job of all as father to Tyler and William, and now as a grandfather as well. Through decades of committed service, he's found a way to do it all. But even so, I know Richard's excited to make up for lost time. So we thank our colleague for his outstanding work for our country, and I have it on good authority that our friend has a favorite catchphrase that he's used to bid farewell to his office after they've spent a long day doing good work. So Richard, as you like to say, dilly dilly.